This is Office Talk with Annette Stepanian. Welcome back to another episode of Office Talk. I'm so excited to share this episode with you. I had so much fun recording it. It's with Jill Stanton, who is one half of the Screw the 9 to 5 community. She runs that business alongside her husband, Josh. And in this episode, Jill and I had a real girl-to-girl conversation about what it's taken for them to get their business to where it is today. We talk about motherhood as she recently welcomed her new little snuggle bug and how that has impacted her business and then also what lays ahead. And I think you're really going to appreciate just how honest and forthcoming she is about what it's taken for her to get this business to this point. Now, before we dive in, just want to let you know that the doors to Legal 360 Live are now open. If you've been listening for the last few weeks, you know that I am putting together an online summit. It's a live online summit where we're going to basically dig through all that stuff when it comes to the law in your business, and we're going to work on it together. Now, I'm not going to get into all the details here, but if you want to grab your seat, make sure to head on over to yourlegalbff.com forward slash live. That's yourlegalbff.com forward slash live. You'll get all the details there, but don't wait because we are going to get started ASAP. So with that said, grab yourself a cup of coffee, sit back, relax, and enjoy this conversation with Jill Stanton. Hey, Jill, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm pumped to dive in. Thank you. I want to get into a whole lot about, you know, how you've built your business. And I know you have a little bundle of joy (laughs) that's come into the picture recently. So I want to talk all about that. But before we get into all of that, if for some reason our listeners haven't heard about you guys, can you kind of bring them up to speed on who you are and what you do? Yeah. So I am one half of screw the nine to five dot com. My husband, Josh, is the other half. And essentially, it's a lifestyle brand for entrepreneurs. We help entrepreneurs essentially build more traffic and attention to their brand and make more money and get more out of their life. Sign me up. (laughs) (laughs) Tick, tick, and tick. tick. (laughs) So can you just like take me back? How did you even start this journey, Mm -hmm. you know, and you know, I mean, take me back. Yeah. So Josh and I actually started, well, we each had our own businesses when we first, well, actually, no, when we first met, I was still a bartender, but he had a software business and an online course business at the time. And I eventually found my way into having a service-based business. So I had a social media management business for bars and restaurants. And I was working like a fiend managing all these clients. And I was looking at him like working half days and making all this cash. And I was like, what is this fool doing that I am not doing? And how do I get some of that in my life? And kind of around the same time, we were both becoming really disenchanted with our separate businesses. And we just decided to give it a shot and see what it would look like if we were to run a business together. So we started that back in like very early 2012, kind of like the very end of 2011, actually. And we started a network of affiliate sites. So our first one was a skincare site, which is hilarious because Josh was uh, <laughs> reviewing skincare products with me. He was such a trooper. But <laughs> <laughs> what we found is that, you know, we started creating content, driving traffic, and we were starting to make all these affiliate sales, which is one of my favorite forms of revenue because it's so hands off and high leverage. And it was starting to work really well that we're like, oh, let's do this again and again and again and again. And eventually we ended up with like 30 different affiliate sites in different health, skincare, beauty kind of niches. And around that time, like maybe six to eight to 10 months in, people were like, do you guys even work? Like, what are you doing? Because (laughs) we had replaced our income. And so we'd go on trips and we'd just go like on workations. And we just started noticing a lot of the same questions coming up. Like, how do you guys make money? And how the heck can I get some of that in my life? And It was on the one week where we probably shouldn't be working, which was our wedding week (laughs) in (laughs) December 2012. And we were in Costa Rica and it was just before our wedding guests were arriving and we were sitting on the balcony having a having a few rums. (laughs) And we were talking about this because we were about to move to Thailand after our wedding. And we really wanted a way to document that journey so that when people did say stuff like that, like, do you guys even work? Like, how do you make all this money? We could just send them there. And so we were just 
kind of hemming and hawing over around what we would call it. And, you know, a few rums in and I was like, you know what? Like, screw the nine to five. <laughs> <laughs> and both of us are like, oh, my God. I wonder if that's name. available. Yeah. And we searched it, bought it right away. And truthfully, we did nothing with it for about four or five months. We didn't launch it till April because we didn't really have plans for it. We didn't know what it was. And so we were just like, I don't know, is this a travel blog? Like, what is this? And so it's really just been kind of like a five-year process of throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what works and like cutting what doesn't and amping up what does. And that's it. Like, there's been no real secret like magic fix or anything it's just been a process of consistency and like keeping our ear to the ground and really listening to what people want yeah it's funny because it really is that simple and it's like I know myself I tend to overcomplicate things Me and <laughs> it's really not it's like you got to underthink it you know I love <laughs> that underthinking underthink it I'm trademarking that I'm just kidding yeah you should <laughs> the true um, lawyer in you <laughs> yeah right no I'm just teasing so underthinking it in the sense of like trying things, but then stripping away. And I think the editing of it is mm -hmm. so much harder than the creation of it, right? Totally. About how you can synthesize what it is you do and really perfect that like one thing, you know, that you're really, really good at. So can you kind of walk me through just like your journey? I mean, you've been at this now for quite a while. Mm -hmm. And I definitely want to talk to you about what kind of like shifts you're seeing in the industry as well, mm -hmm. because there are so many more folks kind of quote unquote in the industry now, mm -hmm. you know, and technology is changing and the way we consume information is changing. So kind of, can you take me back on like kind of the evolution of your business and um, kind of very high level of where it started and kind of where it is today? Well, it started with a whole lot of day drinking and ugly crying, <laughs> <laughs> but truthfully, I'm not lying. So the year that we launched Screw the 9 to 5, which was 2013, we had never run like a personality driven brand, right? Like we didn't know what the F we were doing. So we were just seriously, when I say we we're throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what worked, that's pretty much our first two years in business. And so we created a course called Badass Guest Blogging. And really this should have been our first indication that it was going to fail horribly because <laughs> we didn't ask anyone what they wanted. We didn't really know what screw the nine to five was at that time. And so we had, we just documented our travels. So literally, if you were to go back to our like very old content, it might even be archived and privatized now because it was so just unapplicable to what we do now. But it was like travel videos and like yeah. how we live in Asia on the cheap and all of this kind of stuff. So we we're like, surely people would want to know how we use guest blogging. So let's create an entire course around that. No, no one wanted to know and not one damn soul bought it. And so that was like our real first lesson in, you know, idea validation, building an audience that actually cares <laughs> mm -hmm. and asking them what they want. So 2013 was really full of failure. And like I said, ugly crying. And then 2014, we really started examining like why that happened and using it to kind of inform our next step. So we did a hard left turn once badass guest blogging failed. And we were like, what do we know? Like, what can we actually start talking about? Ding light bulb moment. We know affiliate marketing since we had a whole other business around that. And so we started talking about that and teaching that process. And that's where things started to really pick up for us. So we launched our first successful course around that called at the time lifestyle affiliate we started doing like weekly webbies, all of that kind of stuff. Then it's like, should I go through each year? Cause each year has a highlight, but I don't want to like, I, love, I don't want it no, to be annoying. I, no, I mean, I, I think it's, it's, I think it's valuable, you know, for okay, people cool. to see the evolution and for, to learn from it. So Sweet. Please. So 2014, we learned, oh, teach what you know. So that was a big, <laughs> a big <laughs> light bulb moment. 2015, I started my first free Facebook group. And the big lesson around that was really the power of community, right? Like really building an audience of believers and actually caring what they care about. Like one of my favorite quotes is care about the, what the people you care about care about. That was mm -hmm. 2015 for us. So having that group and then 
at the time we had Screw You, which is our monthly membership community, but it was a one-off digital program at the time. I asked the group, do you want a one-off digital program or do you want like a monthly lower cost membership? They were all about the lower cost membership. So we did that hard left turn and then things really started to roll. Then 2016 was like our first real successful launch, like 100K in profit. And then 2017, we kind of got in our own way, (laughs) big time, (laughs) pumped the brakes. I think we took our foot off the gas truthfully like we had built up all this momentum we had a big breakthrough year or a big breakout year in 2016 where we like 9x our income or something ridiculous like that and in 2017 we're like oh my god this is so easy yeah (laughs) clearly we figured everything out and so I think we just coasted because we have a monthly membership site like we have that recurring revenue it was comfortable and so we're just like let's just take it easy and then the minute you start to take it easy and you coast is when the momentum slows down and then I don't know about anyone else but it sure got me in my head around like oh my god is everything dying are we dying is the brand (laughs) dying (laughs) and really kind of like I don't know any other way to say it other than we got in our own way and kind of hit the brakes and now this year we've picked back up momentum and everything's rocking and rolling we had a baby like it's yeah it's been a really interesting journey yeah a very long-winded explanation of that sorry about that (laughs) no don't apologize um i think i think it's like i said i think it's helpful for people i think sometimes when we we go on facebook and we see those posts and you know everybody seems like you know they've they've become the seven-figure business and like they you know (laughs) yeah like and they can you know and how you can do it too yeah mm-hmm. and all these things and like i think it i'm gonna now go on a little bit of a rant because i think sometimes what happens is first of all the representation isn't always accurate mm-hmm. it doesn't always show the truth mm-hmm. and then what bugs me is that people end up feeling bad about themselves because they're comparing themselves to something that isn't necessarily a full and accurate picture so they don't necessarily see that you know, they've, it's taken five or six years to build up to that point. Or maybe they did bring in seven figures, but they spent, you know, $900,000 to get there. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think it's, it's, I appreciate you being so transparent and saying like, Hey, this is what it's, this is what it's taken. And, you know, we got comfortable and, Mm -hmm. you know, we had to kind of push the gas again. And well, I feel like it's super, like you said, it's super misleading and it's irresponsible truthfully of those entrepreneurs it's one of my biggest pet peeves like I'm sure so many other people because I sit there and compare myself to that stuff you know like our business isn't exactly where I want it to be yet but it's on its way but you never see you only see the highlight reel and what I really want to start putting out there more is the behind the scenes stuff like the real because I know when I was first starting and watching you know the big heavyweights of our space I'd be like oh my God, they have it all figured out or it's so easy for them or they've obviously never had to deal with this or this or this. And so I would love to be that kind of like beacon of truth for some yeah. people who are like in that position because I know how much it sucks. Yeah, and the reality is like nobody really knows what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> We're all just winging it, guys. <laughs> everybody's like, I mean, they know what they're doing. Obviously, every experience informs yeah. the next, but like everybody's testing. Everybody's trying like something different and it's you know even in law you call it a law practice right because it's not or like a a medical practice because you're practicing you're never like okay like I know exactly how everything is going to work out every single time so thank you for that so speaking of that I mean looking into like 2018 and like looking beyond you kind of hinted at it a little bit but like I feel like there's like a few shifts going on, like the the tectonic plates are moving. (laughs) Like, what do you as someone who interacts with a lot of, you know, entrepreneurs or, you know, folks who want to start running their businesses, like what are some trends or shifts that you're seeing taking place that are kind of maybe on the horizon? And you're like, oh, that's interesting. I'm going to kind of pay attention to that. You know what shouldn't be a trend, but it is a trend. It should just be like what we all do is like transparency. And Uh how like vulnerable post alert 
that stuff should just be normal and like the stuff that we're not scared to share. But I notice that people are like, just be transparent. It's like the hot thing to do in marketing. And I'm like, yeah. no, no, homies, just like be yourself. And that's being, you know, that is one thing I see a lot of people starting to do more. Obviously, yeah. I think Instagram stories is becoming like the bee's knees but one thing we're really excited about and one thing we aren't going to shut the hell up about this year is like getting back on the organic traffic train again like building your own asset and not just yeah. relying on someone else's site or someone else's platform or a social media network just to like build your own audience like really building your website traffic and stuff that you own and you control and like an algorithm can't disrupt for you can't take you out of the game with like one fell swoop of an update i think that is becoming more of a thing as people start talking more about like these big shakeups and all that kind of stuff people are like how do i avoid that well you avoid it by building your own website traffic <laughs> and your own email list and you know like building an audience that i see becoming more and more of a thing as people like start to wonder, oh, should I even build my Facebook page? Or, oh, should I even drive ads? The price is going up or blah, 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 blah. Is that a sustainable, all of that kind of stuff. I think that organic traffic and really building an audience of believers is a big deal for a lot of people. It's going to continue to be, especially if you want to have a long-term business, right? Like if you don't yeah. want to be a flash in the pan, you really seriously need to build an audience. People who like know to go check out your stuff the same time every week, they look for your emails, they show up to your social media profiles they want to see what you're doing because they enjoy following you that's what you want to start building so you know just a few thoughts on that you know i don't know how familiar you are with the gdpr regulations coming out in the next mm -hmm. well they've already come out but going to be enforced in the mm -hmm. next few weeks you know we don't know what that's going to look like in terms of facebook advertising or you know how all of that will unfold and i think to your point it's especially everything that's been going on with like data breaches you know it's something to think about like mm -hmm. hey if like your only source of traffic is by running ads let's say on facebook like maybe it's time to diversify because <laughs> what if that source gets shut off either yeah. because it's become too expensive or not that it, I don't think it'll not be available, but maybe might not be as accessible to us as it has been in the past. So you want to think about how do you do as just as you diversify your investments. I think it's the same way as like you diversify your your traffic, traffic. channels. Yeah. But Right before this call, I was talking to Kate Erickson from Entrepreneur on Fire, and we were talking about the GDPR stuff. And I said to her, like, I literally just want to put on our site, like, if you're here from the EU, turn around and go home. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't want you here because I'm so scared of it. You know, like, it's so confusing around oh what gosh. is happening. So, yeah, I, I just you. recorded a podcast episode as well this morning about that and honestly I mean and I'm a lawyer and it's it's daunting and because yeah. I have the mindset of a like lawyers can speak we're totally going on a tangent right now but lawyers can speak very theoretically about like laws and regulations and compliance but then I have my small business owner hat on I'm like okay well what the hell does this mean if you know for me who has like a website yeah. you know like, what do I have to do well, like what are the practical things and I think it's all gonna unfold you know to be to, to be seen you know so anyway that's a whole other conversation yeah. but shifts in the industry and about vulnerability now i'm going to be transparent here <laughs> vulnerable <laughs> share alert <laughs> yeah it's hard for me to be vulnerable online you know i mm -hmm. think in person you know people will say look you're so relatable and you know like one-on-one -on -one, i'm like i'm good but i think a lot of people struggle like being vulnerable and where do you kind of draw that line or maybe there isn't a line to be drawn of like okay i'm being vulnerable but hey in this vulnerability i can still lead you or i can still yeah. you know be that resource for you so like do you have any kind of thoughts on that or like how do you kind of coach people through that if at all well I think the easiest and I so understand what you're saying because I've struggled with this because if you're in a position where you teach anything you don't want to look like you don't have your shit together right like you don't want to be like guys I don't know what I'm doing yeah <laughs> because then people will be like okay bye yeah but really owning where you're at in your journey like one thing I've learned to just own and not be so scared about is I don't have all the answers. 
I really don't. Like, I'm still trying to figure it out myself. I'm just a few steps ahead of where our current members are at or Mm -hmm. where my audience might be at. So I'm just trying to speak to that experience that we are currently going through and sharing the behind the scenes of that and like what's worked for us and certainly what hasn't worked for us. And then like leading through that because I'm not Mm -hmm. trying to be the expert in everything. Lord knows I would be terrible at pretending to do that because I would just feel like such a fraud and then I feel like I would get myself caught up in like a web of lies trying to be this like be all end all brand that knows Mm -hmm. all the answers so just owning where you're at and still serving but like speaking from your current journey and being honest about it and be like here's where I'm currently at I'm going to take you guys along for the ride show you what's working show you what's not and like come hang with me that's yeah that's yeah. kind of like the position I take on it. Yeah. It's funny because you almost have these like mentors, like I know I do. Maybe they don't know me, but like you you kind of watch them or you learn from them from afar, you know, mm-hmm. and it's kind of comforting for me. Like I always pay attention to like, why am I paying attention to this person? Like, what is it about this person that resonates with me? And I, I do have to say the folks who are more vulnerable or transparent, <laughs> you know, <laughs> whatever that buzzword is, you know, it makes you feel like, oh, okay, like I can do this. Like this person, you know, has gone through that experience and like, they're, you know, it, it's, it's doable. It's just, and that you feel the sense of connection. So, yeah. and I always wonder this, like why there is this like pressure on online entrepreneurs. I can guarantee, I doubt brick and mortar entrepreneurs put themselves through this kind of like emotional warfare where they like compare themselves to other brick and mortar entrepreneurs. Like I would be shocked if they actually do that. But in our space, it's like so common to sit there and compare yourself and think that you're not doing well enough because, you know, someone else's funnel converts higher than yours or some ridiculous like that. I think, and I'm going to like, you might hear my like little notebook because I'm going to read a quote. I went to a conference recently and someone said something and I was like, ding, ding, ding. Um, I think it's, (laughs) I think it's one is because I I do think a lot of us have personal brands, Mm -hmm. you know, so your sense of self is very intertwined with Mm -hmm. the business. And so it's okay. Even if your name is on something, I think there has to be a disassociation with, you know, the whole like, oh my God, what is that book? The E-Myth Revisited, Mm -hmm. you know, I don't know if you've read that book, but Josh has, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> I'm not a book reader, really. Oh, I'm like okay. so proud of myself that I read Traction. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm the most accomplished person ever. <laughs> I have to say, though, I think some people read too many books and don't spend enough time implementing what they've learned. They just consume information. But that's a whole other conversation. because yeah. I'm guilty of that. But, you know, that book was really good in like trying to create that separation of like you are not your business, right? Yeah. Like you're really building a business that should function on its own. So even if it has your name on it, the idea of creating systems and processes. And so that was, I think, one of the first times that I that really that book really helped me to see that distinction. But to go back to the quote that I was going to say, someone said too many people are too busy trying to become celebrities versus running a great service. Right. I just was like, boom, you know, I was like, that is so true. I think so much of our egos are wrapped up in it. And I think that's why. Totally. So we just totally. have a call here. <laughs> I mean, I really think there's this like weird web celeb thing that we've got going on in our like online entrepreneur space. And it's so unnecessary. Like all we are is just a bunch of business owners and some people are more further ahead than others. And like that doesn't celebrify who they are and what they do. It's just they have they got started before you they've been through the ringer more and like I remember when I was really struggling with this whole thing and like really comparing myself and getting into my own head and I was talking to James Wedmore who's I love a good James. yeah he's so great and <laughs> I was great. voice texting with him and he sent me back a voice text and he, it just said like two lines dude stop taking this so seriously and I was like Oh, damn it. (laughs) You're so right. Because why? Like, you can take it seriously if you want your business to succeed and you want to serve your members and all that kind of stuff, which is great. Or your customers, your clients, whatever. But like comparing yourself to others and like, oh, she makes more than me. Oh, my God. She makes it look so easy. Oh, my God. He gets all these opportunities. Oh, my God. She speaks on all these stages. Like, let's just get over it. I know, and it'll never end, you know, and that's like what I try and tell myself too. It's like, okay, you get that next thing that you thought was like so cool, 
And then there's going to be like the other thing and the other thing, which is what makes life so exciting in the sense of like progress, right? You always want to kind of like raise that bar so that, you know, you don't want to become mediocre, but it's just, just never going to end. I think when you tie your sense of self so closely to that, that's when it becomes counterproductive, right? So. Yeah. And I think I've definitely been guilty of doing that. I think that's why I got into my own head and in my own way, because I did that. Like I just had all this self-imposed pressure and then you pull back and you're like, yo, we're just running businesses here. (laughs) Like it's not (laughs) like, it's not our everything. We are other, we have other things going on. All of us as entrepreneurs. So I'm curious. I think this is a nice way to kind of shift the conversation of what has, you know, I know you recently, you guys had a, a baby. Mm-hmm. Has, how has that changed? Oh. Wait, I mean, <laughs> that, cause, and I'm asking because, you know, my husband and I were hoping to start a family in the near future. And so I'm like, I'm really freaked out about it, but yeah. Yeah. So tell me, I literally <laughs> spent the last month before he got here, like seriously crying. Cause I was so scared. I was exactly like you. What does my life look like? after like my business is my baby how am I going to make time for another baby like I was so in my head who does this like how am I going to be able to show up in the business I always wore this like badge of like I'm the doer in the business I'm the one who gets all the done how does that play out once I have a little one to take care of will I like being a mom that was my biggest fear like I remember Mm -hmm. talking to Nikki Elledge Brown who is literally Mm -hmm. one of the greatest people to talk to about not only business, but just life and parenthood stuff. She has such great perspectives. And I said to her, I don't know if I'm supposed to admit this, but I'm really nervous. I'm going to resent being a mother. Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad I was honest with that because truthfully, I had no expectations going in. Yeah. (laughs) And it's been so much better than I ever expected. Not only because he's everything to Josh and I, but it's caused us to get so laser focused on what works and forget the rest. Like I do not mess around in like bullshit tasks anymore just to keep myself busy. I'm Mm -hmm. only doing the stuff that moves the needle because I want to create this like baller life for our kid. Also, I'm really, when you reference like we aren't our businesses, that is one thing that the book traction is a big like you are not your company your company Mm -hmm. is is its own entity and you need to make responsible decisions for that but it is not you you know what I mean and so once I learned that concept allowing ourselves to like really get clear with what our team's doing and like accountability and KPIs and like consequences if they don't hit them and if we don't hit them and like hiring smartly now not just because we're drowning in overwhelm and you know, all these tasks that really don't do anything. Mm -hmm. All of that became crystal clear once we had a baby and I'm only two months in guys. I don't even know what I'm going to learn in the next, (laughs) the rest (laughs) of the year, let alone, you know, the coming years. So I went in just kind of like a blank slate being like, all right, let's see what this looks like. Let's see if we can like still pull it together. And ever since then, it's just like Denise Duffield Thomas always says, babies bring abundance and that so sat with me because I was like I hope she's right (laughs) and it's like truer words have never been spoken because they just they allow you to see what matters and focus on that rather than like the stupid ego driven we concern ourselves with yeah and they're like limitless like they have no limitations right and so like you just see them like totally just like pure joy. I was you know? just going to say pure joy. Yep. Yeah. So true. it's just, it's interesting. Cause I, I, I appreciate your honesty and your vulnerability. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Because I'm part of me is freaked out because I'm thinking, well, how is this all going to change things? And we just got back from vacation and I was like, kind of like journaling and thinking about how in my mind I had define that if you become a mom, you have to lose certain parts of yourself. So like Mm -hmm. something ridiculous is like, you can't be like, you know, the kind of the toll it takes on your body, right? That like, Mm -hmm. oh, because you have, you're a mom and you go through this pregnancy, you're going to get out of shape. Right. And then I was like, why am I thinking that? Like, there's so many examples of like, I see women all the time, like they're working out, like they Mm -hmm. look great. They're eight months pregnant. So like my point being like, I had to redefine for myself, like kind of these limitations and like, let go of that. Like, okay, just because you're a mom, it doesn't mean you have to let go of yourself. Right. Um, You can, you can still be, I think for me, because 
my biggest worry is about losing myself mm -hmm. in as a mother and like forgetting all the other roles, right, that I play. And so I was like, okay, I need to start reframing that for myself that it's just because like a mom is one role you play, but there's all these other components of you and they don't necessarily have to be all or nothing. Like they can be, you know, they can exist on the same kind of a horizon. So, yeah, I said to Josh, like, I want to have it all. I just don't want to do it all. <laughs> but it's true. Like, I want to have it all, but I'm absolutely going to nanny up. It just so happens that our moms are here. So I kind of have like a built in, we call them granny the nanny because literally that's yeah. what they're, they're acting as nannies right now so that I can work because I still want to work. I don't want to, yeah. I was, I actually feel weirdly guilty admitting this, which I shouldn't because why would I feel shame around it? But like, I literally started dipping my toes back into work 10 days after I had a baby because I freaking wanted to, because I don't want to just sit there and do nothing all day. I, mm -hmm. <laughs> I can only imagine how many moms are like, F you, we don't yeah. do nothing all day because I know how busy I am when I'm trying to just like manage Kai all day. But yeah. you know, I, I wanted to do other things. I have other goals and I just or wanted to get back other into parts it. Of yourself, yeah. Right? That's a great and way of putting it. Yeah. So like when you're a mom, you're a mom, you know, but then like there's, I think different, I mean, there's different parts to yourself that need to be stimulated and energized, right? So that yes. you could be a whole person. That. So that's awesome. So I'm curious to know, like, what did you guys do to get ready for the baby in terms of your business? Like how mm. far in advance did you guys like start planning and getting the team in place or like what were some, some of the kind of the big things that you're so glad you did or Maybe you're like, oops, we should have done that. <laughs> yeah. Like, One of the things I'm super happy we did was batch all our content. Like we gave ourselves 13 weeks of freedom by batching all of our content for that long. So batching was a huge one. Absolutely. Getting a lot of systems and processes in place so that we really wanted to start running more of a systems dependent business and not a people dependent business. So that was another big thing. Batching meals. That was a big thing. Having our moms here to help fill in while we do work because, you know, we have goals and shit. <laughs> but around the team side of things, see, there's two of us. This is where we're yeah. lucky. There's two of us running this business and we're both here. So Josh really took the business and like the op side of things while I took the content. So it allowed me to do things like on my night shift when Kai's sleeping, but I, I'm not sleeping yet. So I would just power through writing. So he would really manage the team for us and like, you know, just follow up and get that accountability in place and make sure that they're doing what they said they're going to do. And now we're just hiring our integrator and getting her onboarded. So it's still a process. Like I didn't get everything done before Kai got here, but we absolutely cleaned up the messiness of our business before he got here and like really started planning ahead more so than like staying reactive, which I feel like was a big pattern we had last year. And you touched upon something that I have noticed recently is I think that a lot of people have partners behind the scenes. So mm -hmm. sometimes there might be a brand where like one person is the face of the brand, mm -hmm. but there is a partner behind the scenes kind of, I'm assuming, complementing the other person's, you know, strengths and weaknesses. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think that is a great point that, you know, having that partner or having that team or somebody, your right hand person there makes it so much easier. So and much easier. <laughs> <laughs> How is it working with your husband? Because I thought my husband could work really well together and he still <laughs> thinks we could. But sometimes, you know, the way we communicate, yeah. I'm like, there's no way we could work together. <laughs> yeah, I feel you. Um, it's yeah. definitely, I mean, it took us a long time to figure it out because when we first started working together, we both wanted to be right. You mm -hmm. know, like, no, I've got this. No, this is how you do it. No, I know how I do this because I'm the expert. You know, it's just ridiculous. Now we very much have clearly defined roles in our business. And I do not mess with Josh's side and he does not come into my lane. Like I very much trust that he has his stuff and he very much trusts that I have my stuff. And we just have that clear, honest communication. Was it always like that? No, we started our business together the year we were getting married. Don't do that. <laughs> it was, I was, some days I was like, damn, are we actually going to get married? Um, <laughs> because it was rough. Like you don't really know how to kind of divide and conquer if you've never done it before and you're mixing business with your relationship. And so yeah. it's hard to turn things off and it's hard to separate that, you know, but. 
clear, honest communication, number one, absolutely. Patience and empathy, number two. And then clearly defining your roles and trusting that the other person has that and like not micromanaging them. Your partner does not want to be micromanaged by you. Like that's the easiest way to kill your relationship. So those three things are something we always keep in mind. That's awesome. Good things for me to consider too. I love the like, (laughs) you know, letting go of the need to be right all the time. Right. So because what does that solve? So what? You're right. Now you're in a fight with your partner and that sucks even more. Yeah, so I'd rather be happy than right all the yeah, time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, I love that. So looking forward into the future, you know, you've got your little baby, yeah. you know, in tow. You've got all of this stuff, you know, systems and teams and moms helping. Like, what is on the horizon for you guys in 2018? Mm, so many fun things, actually. <laughs> we have a like a traffic program that we're really excited about. We've just kind of kicked that off. So that's called 90 day traffic plan. We're super excited about that. And then just like we've made a commitment to kind of go back to our roots and we've really started prioritizing like collaborating with other entrepreneurs in this space and doing some really cool JV partnerships. So that is something I'm super excited about because I love, like I said, like, I don't have the answers to everything and I'm not an expert in everything. And there's certainly people or other entrepreneurs in this space who are better at certain things. So I would much rather collaborate with them and spread the word on what they have to say and what they're experts at and then direct our peeps towards them rather than trying to do a half-assed job and be the be all end all. The screw is a very general brand, you know, like it's a lifestyle brand. Mm -hmm. And so where most people follow the kind of the advice around like niche down till it hurts. We're like, nah, bro, we're going to go as broad as we can. (laughs) Um, So it opens up a lot of opportunities for us to kind of shine a light on a lot of people doing cool things in this space and kind of introducing them to the scroopies and just spreading the word and just blowing this bitch up. (laughs) So (laughs) that's 2018 for us. I love it. Well, I'm excited to see and follow you guys, see how all of that unfolds and kind of wrapping it up here. If you were to go back and like, kind of tell yourself like what are like the two or three like levers that you guys have pulled that have proven to be really positive for you guys like what are some of those nuggets Mm. number one which is so not sexy is consistency like I really think that's what stopped us last year is we just stopped being as consistent as we used to be we had like three and a half straight years of consistent content creation and podcasts and doing interviews for other people and then all of a sudden like midway through 2017 we're like we're not going to do any of that anymore because just because and so that felt like it brought everything to a grinding halt even if that wasn't the case it felt that way because momentum is our oxygen so consistency number one and then number two is really never being afraid to continuously promote and sell and spread the word on what you have to offer because Mm -hmm. like if you have something people need it's on you to get it out there and I feel like that's another area where we kind of got in our own ways we were like well we don't want to be too pushy and blah 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 whereas really if you have something cool why wouldn't you talk about it it's almost like you're ashamed of it you know and so getting out of my own way and kind of getting back into that mode has been a big learning lesson for us And I know people like to touch on that second point. I know a lot of people struggle with that, especially like me too. Like I am not a natural born salesperson. Right. Mm -hmm. And like, what are a few things that you did that you have kind of, whether it's your mindset and you touched upon that like in the comment, but what is it that has worked for you in terms of making that shift of not being afraid to sell and doing it in a way that again, feels very authentic and not like, sleazy because that's what a lot of my listeners are like afraid of is they don't want to be sleazy they don't want to sound salesy but that's what they need to do to bring in the money into their business well I don't know if it was anything specific Josh and I both work with a coach named Jim Fortin and he does a really good job of kicking our ass Um, so (laughs) one thing he would always say is like Because we'd be like, well, we don't want to like bother people. And are we actually good enough to actually get this out there? And one thing he always would say to us is like, how many people need to tell you you're good enough until you start to believe it? Mm. And we were like, damn it. 
<laughs> I guess we have enough, Jim. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Stop kicking our ass. But truthfully, that his just his little like mindset smackdowns, or like he was talking to us about our goals. Or sorry, he was talking to Josh about our goals, and Josh was kind of like walking through what we wanted to do for 2018. And he's like, "Huh, that sounds pretty reasonable." And Josh's like, "Thank you. I think so too." And he's like, "Yeah, just remember, reasonable people make reasonable money." And we're like. Damn it! <laughs> you know, so you know, just little yeah. things like that of like, why not us? You know, and like, what do we have to lose? So what if someone chirps us and is like, you guys are so salesy. Yeah, bro. Welcome to the game. Like, <laughs> how are you going to sell anything or make any kind of money for your business if you're not spreading the word? So yeah. it's kind of like I just had to suck it up and get over the fear of judgment. I think that's what it is, actually, if I were to boil it down is one thing people are nervous about is not if they come across salesy. It's the fear of being judged. You know, who wants mm -hmm. to get called out or trolled or have mean things said to them? You know, no one wants that stuff. But like if you just kind of harden the F up and realize it's going to happen then you're kind of a bit more prepped for it. And if you don't really care about what people think of you, because you're just mm -hmm. in your own lane doing your thing, mm -hmm. I really feel like that starts to help remove that fear. Yeah. And kind of going back to your comment about the goal setting, you know, one of the things I was like journaling when I was on vacation was like, if I had a genie in a bottle and the genie was like, you can have any wish, like not even one, you could have a million wishes if you want, like, what would that be? And I would encourage people to like kind of go through that exercise. Cause... I was literally thinking like, what would my million wishes be? <laughs> <laughs> like you're not limited to three wishes, you know what I mean? It's not like Aladdin, but like really there's like, again, abundant, right? Mm -hmm. Like what would that be? And it was so like, even with that type of permission, yeah, it was so, I was still limiting it, you know, like. I was still kind of trying to make it reasonable or logical or like not asking for too much or, and so I thought it was a very interesting exercise for myself to like realize like, wow, how much you even limit yourself when you're given permission to dream, um, mm -hmm. even in that sense. So I don't know what I would, I still need to go back and fill that up, but I know I'm like, definitely I would be like constant sunny days for sure. Cause I'm right now we're living in Vancouver and that's definitely not a thing. <laughs> Never ending supply of gin. That would be number two. <laughs> I'm noticing a theme here. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's hilarious. Yeah, no, it's, it's fun to think about that, but Jill, thank you so much for being here and taking the time. I know your time is so valuable, especially with the new kiddo mm -hmm. there. So thank you for being here and being so so vulnerable and transparent <laughs> and sharing all of your insight with us. Thanks so much for having me. It was such a good conversation. There you have it, my friend. As always, you can find all the links to find Jill and Josh over in the show notes. You can find that over at AnnetteStepanian.com forward slash podcast forward slash 75, or you can contact them directly over at screw the nine to five.com. That wraps it up for another episode. Stay tuned for next week when I'm going to be publishing a brand spanking new episode for you. It's going to be awesome. I'll see you here next week. Before you skip to that next episode, I want to invite you to a special event called Legal 360 Live. In this live online summit, we're going to walk through what you need to know, legally speaking, as you start and grow your business. So if you're ready to roll up your polka dotted sleeves and finally get your legal house in order once and for all, head on over to yourlegalbff.com forward slash live. That's yourlegalbff.com forward slash live.